Yeah, you know, it, it was all it was all mixed together. Really amazing, and you could you could see that a little bit from that excerpt of the the direct examination of Mary Stevenson by Hugo Black when he when he says really derisively, you know, was he Greek, Puerto Rican, you know, was he a Dago? Dago was a term that was used, you know, in everyday uh, uh, conversation. Um, came up a lot in the transcripts. You know, it was it was really the transcripts. Um, I was also uh, lucky uh, to to get a hold of uh, were incredibly revealing. That this was a period of time where, you know, race. We always we, we associate Birmingham, Alabama, with race, uh, and it is it was that. Uh, but uh, there was so much more uh, going on during this period the anti-religious, well, anti-Semitic and anti-Catholic in particular uh, uh, atmosphere was, uh, was just so, so palpable. Uh, and the nativist uh, uh, atmosphere, uh, the anti-immigrant atmosphere that existed there uh, uh, was evident from many, and, and, and I did, you, you could see it throughout this story, because it was all of a piece uh, uh, in this, and that's one of the reasons why I actually was as interested in this story as I, I was, because it was so revealing that there were so many other things going on uh, at, the, at the same time, whether it was gender, uh, whether it was anti-immigrant sentiments, anti-religious sentiments, Race then becomes uh, an issue during the course of the trial too, um, as uh, as that uh, uh, direct examination of Mary Stevenson hinted uh, that it, it might uh, as as well. So it was all in there te te together, uh, and uh, that uh, that turned out to make this story of interest to uh, to a, a, a very broad and different uh, communities. So I've talked about this and given readings of this, this book now to Catholic audiences, uh, to groups of lawyers, uh, to uh, women's groups, uh, to uh, groups that are, are uh, very interested in uh, race uh, and ethnicity and uh, and nativism in, in America as, as well. So. Uh, this story uh, just has has so many different things threading through it that I, I, I think um, uh, makes it of interest to a lot of different audiences as well. Other, any other questions, Sal? Yeah. Um, I thought that you said something about how other secret organizations were also anti-everything, um, but who was the Freemasons? Were they like, because they're really, The Masons uh, were definitely, and I and I speak to that a little bit in, in here. And uh, uh, there was a group at that at this time, um, a very secretive group called simply the True Americans. And uh, they called themselves the True Americans, all male um, fraternal organization, uh, very secretive. But um, they uh, they were an anti-Catholic organization. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, this, you know, and the, and not only were so many groups, fraternal organizations like the Masons and others at this time um, uh, anti-Catholic, uh, but uh, you, you, could, you, could, you could just see it at everywhere. And that's the biggest surprise of this story to readers of this book has been the intensity of the anti-Catholicism. People didn't know about that, even Catholics didn't know about that. And I, I had to say, I was raised Catholic. I thought I knew a little bit about uh, anti-Catholicism in, in America, but what I remembered uh, studying about it when I was in high school or so uh, was about an earlier period, the 1850s, 1840s, 1850s, when the know-nothings uh, were, uh, were a big force uh, in, in, uh, in our country. Uh, but not so much this period. 
So that turned out to be uh, the, the big surprise of, of Rising Road was just how open and unapologetic that um, anti-Catholic feeling uh, was. Uh, and so, you know, as, a, as somebody who was raised Catholic, that, that, uh, that was interesting uh, to me. Um, but uh, as, a, as a lawyer, it was particularly interesting to me to see that anti-Catholicism reflected not just in the existence of these organizations, but in law itself. At this time, there were laws that a number of states had passed, like Alabama, uh, that were called convent inspection laws. And people don't even remember these laws existed. I was shocked when I learned about them because I had never heard about them before when I was doing the research for this book. And I talked to a lot of Catholic priests in a, in, uh, about these convent inspection laws Nobody remembered that they even existed. What these laws were, were they were laws that were passed that allowed state officials to go into Catholic-owned buildings like convents, monasteries, even Catholic-run hospitals, uh, rectories, churches, and to look through those, those buildings without a warrant, without prior notice, without a warrant, for people who would be held against their will there, like young women like Ruth Stevenson who might have been seduced into, uh, into uh, Catholicism and then held there to be preyed upon by lustful priests, or more importantly, for stashes of weapons. Because the, a common accusation leveled against Catholics at this time where Catholics were actually going to, were planning an insurrection against the United States, that they were using their basements to stockpile weapons, ammunition, arms, for the day that their leader, the Pope in Rome, would give the sign for the insurrection to begin. And that, so that's what these inspectors were looking for, and that's what these laws uh, reflected, that the genuine nature of the fear that Catholics, the Knights of Columbus, Knights of Columbus, that Catholic male organization, were, were supposedly the foot soldiers of, of the Pope. Now, I say this today, people, everybody, I always laugh. They slow, my students can't understand, they laugh. And, and, I, and I understand it because it seems so ludicrous to us today that that would be the case. But, but one thing that shows us how deadly serious actually was and how widespread the fear actually was, was the existence of those laws. Those laws never would have passed in state legislature after state legislature if those states weren't afraid uh, that, that, that the Catholics posed a genuine threat to the United States. It, and during a period of time when, when patriotism was being demanded, as it always is during a time of war, this was right around the time of World War I, uh, the, and organizations that were rebranding themselves as patriotic organizations like the Ku Klux Klan. It's no accident that this is a period of time when those kinds of laws uh, come into place. Catholics were said not to be able to be true Americans, to be patriots. They couldn't be patriotic to the United States because they owed their allegiance to a foreign leader, the Pope in Rome. And so this was the accusation that was made wild, widely against, uh, against them and was reflected in the positive laws that were passed by a number of states uh, at, at this time. Pretty scary business, right? But it does make us think, I mean, if we can laugh about laws like that or beliefs like that or fears like that today, it's because we no longer are so fearful of that particular religion. But it does, uh, it does cause us to think, maybe, uh, about other religions that we might be fearful of, that might be reflected in the way in which we approach those religions today. So even if uh, the names have changed, uh, stories like this, I hope, you know, make us a little uh, more humble uh, about our law uh, and about our fear and the power that fear has over us to 
maybe even create a legal defense to the killer of an unarmed priest. I sent it to him. He's, okay. he's never gotten back to me about it. Okay. Um, I imagine he, he read it. He knew that I was writing it. They weren't happy, as, were. as you might imagine. Uh, they weren't happy that I was going to write this book about this particular trial because it doesn't show to go black off to, uh, in, a, in a positive way. Uh, and uh, that was an unhappy thing for many fans of Hugo Black. I mean, if you know anything about Hugo Black's life, you'll know that when he eventually went on to the United States Supreme Court, he was there for decades, um, he uh, eventually became uh, a champion of civil rights in the country. The author of a number of the most important civil rights decisions the United States Supreme Court has ever uh, handed down. Uh, and so by the end of his life, he had won many fans. And one of the reasons why he had so many fans was because of his movement away from uh, what people expected him to bring to the United States Supreme Court when he was appointed uh, earlier in his life and where he ended up uh, personally um, as a jurist by the end of his life. Uh, it's, it's part of the reason why I decided to call this book Rising Road was because of sort of that, some, you know, think of this as a, as a metaphor of, of our journey, you know, and as a nation, as this, this person, one individual, Hugo Black, where you begin and where you end up, hopefully, I, I, I hope that, uh, that this story really, because we can laugh now about those laws that existed in the, back, the backdrop of this story, that that means that our journey along that road has been an ascending one, a rising one, uh, and one maybe that we can even take some lessons away from today. Um, is the anti-war movement still alive? Is it much later, and decades later, we still see anti-Catholicism in the country at the time that President um, John F. Kennedy is, is elected. And many people thought, seems like what, many people thought when Barack Obama was running for, for president, um, was that JFK would never be elected president because the country wasn't yet ready to elect a Catholic into the Oval Office. Well, that turned out not to be true, and that turned out to be the time when we would, but there, but the fact that so many people believe that they weren't tells us that anti-Catholicism was still very present in, in America at the time that he was elected. He, he had to address his Catholicism in a public speech in exactly the same way that Barack Obama had to, to address openly in a public speech that he gave in Pennsylvania, you guys might remember about his race, right? So it really, I mean, the parallels actually across time are, are, are really uh, interesting uh, to me in, in that way. But, but one way that we know that even that we've moved away from where we were when JFK was elected is that today, many people forget that, uh, that six of the nine uh, justices of the United States Supreme Court today are Catholic. There are no Protestants on the United States Supreme Court today. That is stunning. And it never would have been possible at the time that this story occurred, which is really not so long ago, if you think about 1921. So, so we have come a long way when it comes to anti-Catholicism if uh, a majority uh, of the uh, justices sitting on the court today can be Catholic without people even you know, actually being aware or, or thinking about that. Right, it was a part of everyday life then. Well.
Any other questions? Good. Thank you very much. Thank you.